Hi, uh, very pleased to be able to share with you today some ongoing research at the Energy Center that this is a small part of uh, an uh, uh, agenda where we're looking at stakeholder engagement and development of energy infrastructure. And a small part of this is a project we've been working on for some time, looking at local community responses to wind turbine development in Ontario. So as Mike Lyle has already pointed out, there's been tremendous growth in renewable energy in Ontario and looking at wind generation capacity alone, you can see that over the last decade we've gone from essentially no installed capacity to somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,700 megawatts or 10% uh, of installed capacity. So this is tremendous growth over a relatively short period of time for very large infrastructure projects. Uh, so it's not, again, as Mike said, not surprising that we're seeing some uh, debate over the pace and the location of infrastructure development. And here are two images that are somewhat opposed to each other in people's views on this development. Uh, one that probably is the one you've seen mostly in the media, uh, where you have uh, um, some resistance to wind turbine development, uh, where saying you know, wind turbines cause property values to go down, hydro bills to go up, stop wind turbines, right? That's a, a, something you've probably seen in the media in the last several years. But it's not the only story. There are communities or people who are in favor of this development and they get much less media coverage. And I, I think something that comes out of our research is that often what we can measure is people's opposition and that um, people's support is more of a passive event. So how can we start to think about ways to understand community confidence? What kind of structure and context can we put on this? Well, we might try and put these factors into bins. I'm an academic. I like to put some structure on things. So we could think about sort of social values and ideology. You know, how do people think about the value of renewable power? I mean, this is something that's at a very global or a very large scale, the benefits uh, to our climate, to our environment of, of having more renewable power whereas the actual costs tend to be much more local. So that distribution of benefits versus costs and how that should be equitably divided is one way we might think about community confidence and why there's conflict in this area. There are also purely economic factors. Uh, how does this affect the property value of my home if I can see a wind turbine? How does this affect you know, landowner benefits? You know, what are they being paid for a lease? What about the communities? What is, what's the community benefit? of a particular project in an area? How are these benefits being distributed among members of the community? These are all things that are important, not to mention effects on energy prices, which have been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, I know that my bill has changed significantly, so this is a factor for me. We also want to look at r the regulatory environment. This is something that's been very important with a changing regulatory environment in Ontario over the past decade. Uh, Mike talked about the most recent initiatives in Ontario, the large renewable procurement, but there have been several other renewable procurement systems. A renewable energy supply program that began in 2003, the renewable energy standard offer program beginning in 2006, uh, the FIT program, and now the large renewable program. So we need to think about the role of municipalities in each of these different uh, regimes, policy regimes. Uh, how does the stability of the policy environment or of the regulatory environment affect people's trust in the government or in the you know, regulatory authority? And how does this affect conflict? And lastly, there are proponent practices. You know, what kinds of consultation and outreach are being performed and what kind of benefits are they distributing in those communities? So our project, or our thinking about this, is that we want to be able to identify causes of resistance or support, uh, but as I said, resistance tends to be easier to measure in a data-driven way. Uh, I'm, I'm basically a statistician who works at a business school, so I believe in data, I believe in numbers. So how can we look at this from a data-driven point of view? And we want to look at not just the wind you know, projects that have been successful, the ones that have been built and are operating, but what happened to all the others too? Now that's a big part of the story that's important in figuring out what's going on in driving conflicts. So the first thing to do uh, is to get data. And there is no comprehensive data on projects in Ontario or anywhere else in the world for that matter that looks at the development process, 
from proposal to actual construction and in commercial operation. So the first thing to do was to begin to develop this kind of data. Uh, and then to perform qualitative and quantitative analyses, where we are at Ivy, we believe in the case study method. So uh, I'm not going to be allowed to only show numbers. I need to also talk about specific cases. And then to take this project-based database, characteristics of projects, and to merge it with socioeconomic, demographic data to try and get at patterns and causes for the types of conflicts that we see. And then I get to do the statistical analysis that I'm really excited about personally. So how do we go about measuring this? And this was our big first big thing to think about. So we would like to know about protests, demonstrations, or, me or shows of support. And really the best way to go about that is to look at news media, is to look at reports in the news. Uh, so we have had so we've, we've had uh, research assistants. Uh, we like to hire both undergraduate and PhD students to do this, to get experience in working with real data. And they've gathered every article that they've been able to find from all the major Canadian dailies, all the local newspapers, and all of the online newspaper repositories over the past uh, 15 years having to do with Ontario wind development and be able to categorize these for the issues that are being discussed. After that, we looked at for legal cases that have been filed. It's another source of data to look at resistance. Where have cases been filed? What have the issues been? What has the resolution of the case been, if any? Uh, and then to look also at the regulatory process. Almost every regulatory process has an appeals process. Is it being used? What are the outcomes? Who's intervening? Uh, and public comments. Most regulatory processes also allow public comments. Who's commenting? How many comments are being, uh, are being made? What are they about? Are they pro? Are they anti? What are the issues that you can glean from reading public comments? And then there's something very interesting that's occurred in Ontario with wind development. There, during the 2013, uh, a large number of municipalities, uh, about 20%, of Ontario municipalities passed a resolution saying they were not a willing host for development. So who were these municipalities and did it make a difference? Did it make any difference in what development occurred? So here are just some nice graph of once you get these measures, what do they look like over time? And you can see that uh, if you look at uh, the sort of burgundy-ish line, I think it's burgundy, uh, that shows you how many wind projects are in the province and of course they're trending upward over time just as Mike said and you'll notice that everything else sort of trends in the same direction whether it's news stories about wind development or legal cases or regulatory appeals so that I don't find all that surprising more projects more written about it more cases to me the the one thing I find interesting in looking at this graph is there's a big jump in both the regulatory appeals and legal cases and it comes right around uh, right after 2010, right around 2010, which is about the same time as the Green Energy Act and the FIT program, which if you're not familiar with the FIT program and the Green Energy Act, one of the biggest differences from previous or subsequent regulations was that for renewable energy projects that were given a FIT contract, they no longer were subject to the same environmental assessment process. They went through a slightly different, more streamlined environmental assessment process. As well, they were no longer subject to the land use and municipal permitting requirements. So, why do we see more regulatory appeals in legal cases then? Again, looking at these it slightly differently, you can see the percentage of proposed projects that were subject to each of these different measures. And over time, we see, a little, we see more opposition. About uh, less than 40% of projects, for the most part, have some degree of opposition by these measures. But what we do see, again, is a spike in protests around 2010, 2011, which is around the same time as the FIT program came into being. So just to give some examples of cases, this is a very typical opposed wind farm, Springwood Farm. It's very small. It was given a FIT contract in July of 2010, had a capacity of about eight megawatts. This is a fairly small development. So 
you know, my prior belief would have been a small development, probably would not have particularly a lot of opposition to it. It took four year, over four years to come into operation. So at the, the, there are two public meetings that are required, and at each of these there were protesters. Um, at one they wore shirts that said, you know, all the issues that they had, at, at, they listed health problems, light pollution, bird deaths, all manner of different issues that they had with the wind turbine siding. And this was in spite of the fact that the project proponents made payments to community benefit funds that were uh, somewhat substantial, uh, $22,000 per year over 20 years. <laughs> and you know, what, you know, despite a large number of stated um, problems with the project uh, in the media, what the organizers said if you actually read their statements, was that their main problem with the project was that they felt that there was no role for the community in the siting decision, and that they did not trust the, the government's regulatory process to take their views into account. That this was their main problem. They made use of every legal avenue to oppose this project. They protested at the community meeting. They uh, made comments at the during the uh, uh, environmental assessment process. They appealed the environmental assessment. The project was delayed with all of with all of these measures, but ultimately did go through. On the other hand, there is a project that I think we would deem as sort of a success that was not really contested. Uh, the South Kent Wind Project is a large project. It's one of the largest projects to go into commercial operation. It's 270 megawatts in the Chatham Kent area. And it went uh, into operation in less than average time for a project, despite the fact that it's uh, a large project, which means it's subject to more regulation. Uh, there were no protests or demonstrations of any kind. And there was a small, there was an appeal to, for the environmental assessment, but it was dismissed essentially immediately. And the municipality itself was never showed itself to be uh, in any way unwilling or unsupportive of, of the process. And the proponent made not only funds available, but did went up above and beyond in terms of the number of meetings that they held in the local community. And they actually brought in professional facilitators to hold these meetings instead of holding them themselves. So this project went through very smoothly with essentially no bumps in the road. Now, one of the neat things with, that we've done with this data, because it does seem to be very project by project, looking at individual articles, uh, it's very hard to pull out trends, was, well, maybe if we look at these on a map, we'll be able to draw out some patterns, and be able to see some things. And my initial feeling was we see larger projects had more resistance, smaller projects had less. Uh, in fact, I have never been able to find that pattern. What I have found is that we see more problems in areas where there's large clustering, so there does seem to be some degree of cumulative effect on communities, much more so than it being the size of the project per se. Uh, this is, we can do the same thing for legal cases that are filed and find a similar sort of pattern. Uh, and then we started to marry this data with uh, demographic data. Uh, this is very aggregate level demographic data, uh, so it's hard to draw out very specific patterns. We're right now we're working on getting much more detailed uh, text file level data <coughs> married to this to do more in-depth analysis. But we started to find even at the most aggregate level some weak relationships. So for example, looking at the number of REA comments which are almost universally um, opposed to projects when people take the time to comment either in writing or online to the, to the environmental assessment process, we noticed that unlike with protests and legal cases filed, you, there are larger numbers of comments in areas with higher property values. Higher median shelter costs is the way that Statistics Canada lists this. So you actually not only see uh, clustering in areas where there are more development for protests and legal cases, but looking at the regulatory process, you see something slightly different. You see a different type of person is participating in the regulatory process to show their opposition than in a protest. There actually seems to be some difference here as where different types of people engage in the process to give their feedback. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I have a lot to talk about. I'm sorry. Uh, let me wrap up very quickly. Uh, and I'll be happy to take questions later. Uh, so what does the data tell us? Let me just wrap up very quickly. 
so uh, these measurements are generally measurements of resistance. It's hard to measure people's support. Usually um, support is people not talking very much and letting the process go through a, a expeditiously. Uh, the passage of unwilling host resolutions showed no relationship to how fast development went on or how much opposition actually occurred. Uh, the size of projects doesn't seem to correlate with anything uh, in terms of resistance to projects. Um, and average community characteristics are weakly correlated with some measures, but we're really looking forward to being able to present some much more uh, micro-level results where I think we'll be able to tease out much more information. 